Hello everyone, welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday, November 12th. Today's topic is Hour of Code and Beyond. Our special guest is Sam Patterson. Your show hosts are Peggy George, I'm Lori Moffat, Tammy Moore, thanks Tammy for doing the closed captioning for us, and Paula Noggle. And I'm going to turn the mic over to Peggy, who will now introduce Sam and ask him the newbie question. Thanks, Lori. We are so excited today. The Hour of Code Week is coming soon. It is December 5th through 11th. And we're really excited to have the guru of coding in the primary grades with us to share his awesome ideas and resources. So if you teach primary grades, you're going to want to check out Sam's terrific book that's called Programming in the Primary Grades Beyond the Hour of Code. I have been a huge fan and follower of Sam's work and creations for years, and I'm always amazed at the creative ways he engages students and inspires them to think more deeply and critically through hands-on learning. If you haven't seen his edu puppets, be sure to check them out in our Live Binder links. Waka is an incredible teacher for young and old alike. Well, in addition to authoring his book, Sam is a poet, a writer, a blogger, a puppet man, a teacher of students, and a Sphero ambassador. Cam Sam has taught in independent schools since 2002 in the subjects of English, writing, darkroom photography, algebra, and pre-calc, calculus that is, um, K through five technology, making and tinkering. He is currently at Echo Horizon School, I hope that's right, Sam, in California. And he is an innovator on his campus. And he uses his blog to reach out to both people in his school and around the world. There are many things that EdTech can do, and Sam is always looking at the pedagogical opportunities and helps teachers to find the best tool for the job. So welcome, Sam. And I'm going to advance to the newbie question. Have you answered that? And then you can take over with your presentation. And for our newbie question, we'd like you to lay the groundwork for what exactly does it mean to use coding to learn? Wow, thanks for that really wonderful and kind introduction. Super excited to be here with all of you today. The audience is great and large, and that's really exciting. Coding to Learn is uh, something I picked up listening to Mitch Resnick, the developer of the Scratch programming language. He works at MIT and has dedicated his life to figuring out how we learn and developing tools to make that work better. Um, and the, the phrase was that first you learn to code and then you code to learn. And when I drill down into that a little bit, what he ends up talking about is programming as a way of organizing and understanding the world, much like writing or drawing. Uh, we think of programming often as a typing activity, but if we take a step back and think of it as kind of a, a multimedia compositional activity, which is really how our kids experience it in apps like Scratch Junior, you can have a student, uh, we did this a couple weeks ago, my students designed a uh, airship in response to around the world in 80 days. These were second graders. And then they used Scratch Junior to program a tour of that airship. So they created kind of an interactive movie in programming. And in the process, they ended up explaining a lot more of what they were doing and making along the way. When we ask our students to create programs about what we're learning, they have to develop their understanding of what we're learning while they create that program. Just like writing a paragraph usually teaches you something about the subject you're writing about, creating a movie or creating a computer program or an animation in Scratch Junior allows students to apply and develop what they're learning. So when we say coding to learn, 
It's when we take programming and put it in that place in our classroom day where normally we would have students write a reflection or explain their thinking. Instead of having them just do that on paper, we turn to, for example, a programming tool like Scratch Junior. <coughs> Pardon me, I'll endeavor to cough away from the microphone. I've got a wee bit of a cold, which isn't bad because it's my first one and it's November. Um, what I would love to start with right now is to just play my most recent episode of my vlog where I'm explaining a little bit about how uh, the Hour of Code can be used as an opportunity to introduce content area coding in the classroom. I'm Sam Patterson from BeyondTheHourOfCode.com. Any teacher in any classroom can find something to do with the Hour of Code to bring programming alive for their students. But many teachers feel like they don't know enough about programming to make that happen. But I'm here to tell you, with the tools that you have available to you on code.org forward slash learn, any teacher can find a relevant activity to their content area right there on the website find the instructions needed to run it, and bring it to the kids. And I encourage everybody to try this out, even if it's just for an hour, so you can see what those students are able to do inside of those challenges, inside of those puzzles and those programs. Specifically, I recommend finding the ones that ask the students to create something instead of just solve a problem. Because when you see students creating with code, you're going to get a sense as to what they can actually do with programming in the classroom. What kinds of things they can build, the kinds of animations, the interactive nature they can bring to displays. All of these types of things will become clear to you as a teacher when you see them working in Scratch, when you see them working with Cano Pixel Hack, when you see them programming their friends to be robots that move around the room. You're going to see how you can take lessons that previously you'd had as desktop experiences and turn them into stand-up whole room group lessons where students are doing more, engaging more, interacting more, and communicating more than they were before just by bringing elements of programming in, even if you don't have devices, even if you don't have robots. What I've learned with programming is that when I use a tool like the tutorials available on code.org forward slash learn, it puts me as the teacher next to my students instead of in front of them. I'm not telling them how to do the activity. I'm asking them where their next piece of information is going to come from. I'm asking them what they want the program to do next. I'm prompting them with the thinking they need to be doing to be successful, but I'm not actually telling them what to do. And most of the time, they're running far ahead of any directions I could give them. The tutorial makes it possible to run a fully differentiated lesson in the class. You can have 24 students doing 24 slightly different things all at the same time and be fully engaged. And you as the teacher can be available to help those most in need of help. The other thing that works out great is very quickly students start helping each other with the programming. When they understand that your job isn't to fix every problem and that you don't actually have that solution, when they find a solution to the problem, they're going to want to share that with their classmates and that's going to make them useful to your classmate, to their classmates. That kind of activity where we help students be useful to their classmates can transform student culture. It can transform the way your kids interact with each other in the room and how they view each other. Instead of just another body in the room, they can see that Bob next to them, he's a resource because he gets this stuff and he's helpful. To go back really quickly, there are all kinds of opportunities on code.org forward slash learn for teachers to integrate just about any content area or to integrate coding, rather, into their classroom in just about any content area. If you go on there now, you can see there's even a menu that allows you to choose content areas you're interested in, and it will sort the available activities to those content areas. So check that out, code.org forward slash learn. You can find this podcast. 
train going by. Check that out, code.org forward slash learn. You can find this podcast and other podcasts at beyondthehourofcode.com or at Sam Patterson EDD in the YouTube world. So if you just type Sam Patterson EDD into YouTube, you should find me. Please subscribe to this channel. Please subscribe to the podcast. Please subscribe to Time Magazine. Um, actually, I'm not that, you know, whatever, Time Magazine. But thank you very much for tuning in and listening to Beyond the Hour of Code. Together, we can do awesome stuff. Tweet at me if you have questions. S-A-M-P-A-T-U-E. Always glad to help. Okay, so thank you for indulging me in that video. Um, there was a question from Ben about the code.org site, and in that video I was showing off code.org forward slash learn, and that is a site of all of the tutorials available through code.org, and it is searchable. So I recommend going in there, playing with it. One of my fa a couple favorites I showed off in there, any of the scratch ones are great. Make it fly and scratch. And it also is one of the greatest opportunities for bringing it back into your classroom if your students are literate enough to work in Scratch. And that's usually about first, second grade. Second grade more confidently than first. Um, <coughs> pardon me. And the uh, Cannell Pixel Hack is also a really good one. There's a lot of really good uh, tutorials. Over the last few years, uh, or this is the fourth year of Hour of Code, more and more companies are going to code.org and working with code.org to develop tutorials. So one of the things I would recommend is just going there and looking around because if you have, say, a Hummingbird Robotics kit around, there actually is a Hummingbird Robotics uh, Hour of Code tutorial up. So, uh, okay. Ben was talking about actually kids creating an app. Um, there are opportunities for students to create apps that go to the Play Store or uh, to Apple, but uh, inside of Hour of Code, not as much. What I focus on mostly in my classroom are opportunities for students to work with code to express something in class, and usually we will export that either as a screen capture or as a file. Um, if you're working in Scratch, you can embed it, which is really nice. Um, in this picture, my a couple of my first grade, second grade students, second grade students are working with, um, oh no, that's first grade because that's Scratch Junior and they're actually creating a um, aquarium. They've been learning about the coral reef and they created a looping aquarium and I taught them about loops and they spent the whole time talking about the different animals in the coral reef while they're creating this uh code project. And that's one of the examples of applied content area learning. They've been learning about coral reefs. You give them an animated coral reef to play with and work on, and they end up talking a lot about coral reefs. Um, why teach programming? It, because it creates opportunities to learn. Uh, a lot of people will talk about teaching programming because of STEM jobs in the future, etc. As a teacher, I'm much more interested in getting kids to work in my class and getting kids to learn. And programming, I've found, creates a very engaging learning environment for students to continue to work in, and they spend more time with the content in there. Ben notes in the chat that Scratch and Makey Makey are fun, and that is absolutely true. Um, this year I went to the Scratch conference in, uh, at, in Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts, and uh, got to meet a lot of great people who are programming with Scratch, and a lot of them are doing work with Makey Makey. If you've never heard of Makey Makey, it is a small board that you connect to your computer that allows you to create buttons. For example, you can create a contact button out of Play-Doh that the computer would then read as the down arrow, and then you can use Scratch to program a response to the down arrow. So you could have a light light up when the down arrow is placed, pressed, and then the makey makey 
allows the computer to think the down arrow has been pressed when a piece of Play-Doh is touched. So you can uh, use Makey Makey to bridge between physical things like keypads and dioramas and that kind of stuff and uh, Scratch. It is probably one of the greatest force multipliers in like bridging the content you're already doing because if you have the kids create a poster, you can then have them use Makey Makey to make that poster interactive. And when you touch one part of the poster, an audio file plays explaining what that part of a geode is, for example. So that's really kind of low-hanging fruit. Um, a cable is Makey Makey. Yeah, well, we, we all want that. But the, uh, you know, it'll probably come at some point, right? Um, what can we learn through programming? So you can learn a lot of stuff through programming. These are my kindergartners working with B-Bots, uh, learning sequencing. Uh, there's so many different things that we can learn through programming. I think it basically comes down to whatever you want because programming becomes an interesting thing to do with information you're learning about. It really is a lot of fun. This was a giant grid I built last year for my littlest students who were working with the B-Bots. And it was really fun because instead of having all of my little, um, I have grids that I've put on a uh, poster board and laminated. Uh, yeah, Maureen, the purple mice are way cheaper. I heard somebody was having some trouble with their purple mice, but you know, they are way cheaper. Um, and some people are really fancy and have large format printers. Uh, Chrissy Venosdale prints out these super awesome uh, Bebot mats, and she actually has a Photoshop file that's the Bebot mat template. Um, <clears throat> when you're thinking about using coding and using basically any app, there's you know a couple different ways you can do it. And I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, how this functions inside of your classroom. And these are the basic areas where you can kind of frame the app, you can get into the app, you can have the kids engage in some sort of level building, or you can do lessons with robots. And these are all options for Hour of Code. This is already kind of stepping beyond Hour of Code because like frame the app, Hour of Code activities work really well with frame the app where you many of these lessons you can't actually get inside of. They are closed. They are a uh, puzzle. And a lot of the very first generation of Hour of Code activities, like the zombies versus plants and that kind of stuff, were this way. And the um, frozen geometry drawing, snowflake drawing out, um, program is this way. These are apps where the students are learning computer science concepts, but you can't really get your content inside of there. So then you have to really kind of frame the learning around that. And this is a great way to teach the kids the basics of programming, right? But it's difficult to go beyond the hour of code inside of these kind of just app-centered activities. I use some closed-end apps year-round with my kids. I use Codable all the time, and my kids love Codable. Uh, the Foos is a nice hybrid environment because they can do some of their own level building in there now, but there is also the um, kind of negotiated leveled uh, approach to it. All right, putting a pause on frame the app. Ben asked me how I made the grid on the floor. I had um, the floor had two foot tiles on it, so I had the basic square set up because I could follow the line of the tiles. So that's how the lines ended up being straight. And then I just measured out every 15 centimeters, which is how far the, the B-Bot moves in one thing. Um, and I actually, on my YouTube channel, have a uh, time lapse of me building one of those grids, a couple of those grids, because it was pretty epic. But it took like an hour and a half, and I was crawling around on my knees the whole time. I should have used knee pads. And yeah, the painter's tape is good. Uh, a pro tip is at the end, when you're ready to have the the, uh, the tape come up, have the kids do it. Because 20-some kids can tear all that tape up in about 10 and a half seconds. And they enjoy tearing the tape up. 
So going back to talking about how to use apps in your class, basically. One is frame the app where you have an into experience, they code, you have a, a reflection experience that you all kind of share. It's difficult for this to get content specific. Get in the app. So Scratch Junior is my favorite spot to do this because I can actually open Scratch Junior on my iPad. I can take a picture of something. I can build some character letters. Let's say I want to do a spelling activity. And my first graders have been learning um, sight words like R, A-R-E. And I put R, E, and A into Scratch Junior as characters. And then they can unscramble that through code, where they code the letters to go in the right order of the word. Right? So we're learning sight words. We're spelling. It's just a spelling lesson. I can send that spelling lesson to all of my kids. It's a lesson I could have ran off on the photocopier, but instead I've built inside of Scratch Junior. And my kids can interact with it, have a good time, and we kind of move on. Uh, Scratch Junior, it should be noted that it is available on just about every platform. It's available in, on iPad. It's available on Android. It's available on Chromebooks. You can get it in the Chrome store. So if you're thinking, oh, there's only one thing in the world I want to learn, it really should be Scratch Junior um, because just about everybody can do it. For fourth graders who haven't used Scratch, we could dabble in Scratch Junior, but at the same time, Coco, I would just take those kids and get them into Scratch as soon as you can. Uh, you can request a teacher account from Scratch, which will actually allow you to um, have your student accounts connected directly to yours to allow you greater supervision. A lot of schools have been waiting for something like this in order to actually implement full usage of Scratch. <coughs> Um, yeah, so get in the app. That's one of my favorite ways to do this, where you have an app that is open enough that they can do content creation in it. And when you're talking about coding to learn, this is where it's most powerful, because I can take my fourth graders last year. Fourth graders in California learned about our state history. There was a gold rush in our state history, and it's important. So they learn about it, and because it seriously affected our population. And when they learn about it, I show them the game Oregon Trail. Many of them have never seen the game Oregon Trail. If you want to feel a little bit ancient, the game Oregon Trail came out over 40 years ago. Yeah. But we give the students a couple examples of Oregon Trail that other people, yeah, I know, Patty, I'm sorry, uh, that other people who have um, created in Scratch and we ask the students to create a gold rush game. They do not have to write this game from nothing. They can actually take the Oregon Trail games that other people have written and remix them into gold rush games, leaving the game mechanism intact, but changing the content to reflect what they've learned. So the fun thing about that is they're spending all of their time trying to think about what are the critical decisions these people have to make. Oh yeah, Ben, remixing is a great start. One of the fun, one of the really good things about programming is that you can remix. They're not writing everything from scratch or from nothing, right? They're starting from somebody else's program. I, as the teacher, can write a basic program to send to them that has the mechanism in place that they just have to modify and use. And this also makes it possible to differentiate what you're doing because the students who need more support can get, um, can get that by taking one of your suggestion things. When I do this um, Gold Rush game piece, I give the students eight different versions of Oregon Trail that they can reference, remix, and look at. And they have to actually make a lot of critical choices about what they're doing. I'm not giving them one model that they're all copying. I'm giving them eight. And I'm saying, in these, find what you need. And I've worked some with the students before that. And if you're listening to this thinking, oh, remixing, what, what, what? It's OK. It's totally OK. You can start off on scratch.org, not scratch.org, scratch.mit.edu. 
and you can have the kids do something really simple, and then you can ask them to do something else really simple that's about what you've learned today. You can actually ask them, how would you use Scratch to express your understanding of this, and see what they do. Give them an opportunity to surprise you. <clears throat> now, Ben's over here in the, in the chat, and he's talking about um, musical instruments, uh, physically controlled, using Makey Makey, and that is super awesome. Josh Berker has done some amazing writing about that, um, and his book is called The uh, Invent to Learn Guide to Fun, and that is amazing for kind of moving from just coding into this coding and real world interaction. You can create a dialogue in Scratch Junior. I have my second grades. Um, my second graders write dialogues, which really has them doing a lot of writing. One of the things I'm always impressed about, impressed by when we're working in Scratch Junior is that they do so much writing. It is such, it's a app which doesn't require them to read anything because it can be all be graphical. But there are so many opportunities to put text into that that we end up doing a lot of uh, work around that. Pardon me. Um, got some resources in the slide deck. Uh, the thing that really got me into coding initially I mean, as Peggy said at the beginning of the webinar, I started off as a high school English teacher and ended up teaching a bunch of different stuff, taught some art, taught some photography, w ended up getting a doctorate in literacy education because writing was so important to me and to my students that when I started working with them with coding and I realized that my students who couldn't yet read could program and I saw the logic they were using, and I saw the cognitive complexity of the activities, I was blown away. So for me, bringing programming into, especially the primary grades, is about allowing the students to engage that completely different level of cognitive complexity that takes place when you're programming, um, and allowing them to really enjoy that and, and just kind of uh, in, you know, participate in that. Um, when you're using an Open Studio app, some of the things I recommend is building the experience around your goal. If you want your students to learn to, you know, explain what they know about the um, rainforest, then that's what you need to help them do by the end of that. Don't just let them play ask them to do something important and hold them accountable. It can be super fun, but give them a focus and hold them accountable because there are a lot of fun, fun, fun things inside of the app. And if you just let them play, they will play. Now, to be sure, the first time you've come to it, let them play. Um, I'm going to stop right now and answer Maureen's question about how do you advise teachers to do Hour of Code who have no programming experience and are afraid. Uh, use the tutorials. Hour of Code is designed to be completely adult free. It is a thing that will do itself. So start with the tutorials. Start with one of the Scratch tutorials. And I love the tutorials because especially if I don't feel like I know what I'm doing, I, it holds my students accountable for reading. And it asks them to really spruce up their learning skills. Many of our students have gotten very uh, used to people telling them exactly what they need to do next. And with the Hour of Code tutorials, they really have to look at the screen and engage. And what I love about going into something like that not knowing what I'm doing is that when I'm doing something like that and I don't know what I'm doing, I end up getting right next to the student much quicker because I just tell them, you know what, I, I haven't done this. I don't know. Let's, what, do, what do you think you want to do next? What do we need to do next? What, what, is it, what, what do we need to do next? And that what do we need to do next is like the most often question, is the question I ask most often to my kids. 
because it's all about getting it down to just that next step. When you're coding, you need to have an understanding of overall what's happening, but you also need to be able to think, okay, what is the one next thing I'm doing and how do we get there? Um, yeah, and one of the things I love about bringing coding into my class is leaders emerge. My students who get it often are super excited that they get it. Some of them are not the ones who get it, get it when we're reading, when we're doing math, anything like that, but when it comes to coding, they have skills and they realize it and their classmates realize it and that changes the knowledge economy in the classroom because the kids learn from each other and like I said, as much as possible, I try to get next to them and if that gives me an opportunity to put one kid at the front, great. Uh, Open Studio app. Open Studio app is an app where you can do stuff. So it's not a closed experience where there's just levels to run through but you essentially, somewhere in that Open Studio app, there is a blank white page that you can make into anything. Uh, Scratch Junior is the best one of those um, that I have. Um, and Scratch and Scratch Junior kind of own that Open Studio space because they're both designed by universities to help people program. They're not trying to sell screen time. They're not trying to sell levels. They're not trying to sell the next version. They're just trying to make a super useful tool for people to use. Um, oftentimes we say, hey, uh, what is, how do we assess these? Assessment is based on learning goals. Oftentimes I use learning goals like social skills, sharing, communication. Uh, these are the things that I assess while we're learning code. And because they're, they're much more important um, than just the do they know how to, um, like do they know how a loop works, right? I'm much more interested, I set learning goals about sharing and that kind of stuff. The teaching we do before the app is about sharing and communication, how to ask for help, how to turn down help, etc. And that's what I like to assess on. I look at how far they get, I watch them while they're working, there's a whole lot of body language that help it, that happens in the world of programming you know, fist pumps, tears, et cetera. When, as the kids get more confident and more comfortable, you're bringing code talks. We ask them to take screenshots when you get frustrated. And at the end of the time, you have them choose one of the screenshots and drop it into Seesaw or Sonic Picks or Blabber, I forget what Blabber Pick, I don't know. Uh, there's a couple different photo narration apps. We use Seesaw right now, which is a really amazing um, uh, sharing platform. And we have them explain how they, why they're frustrated and how they got through it. And that kind of brings it back to perseverance and sticking with it and reflections. Um, there's, so a couple questions. One is, do I recommend doing offline uh, coding? Yes, definitely. I recommend moving back and forth between offline coding, app programming, programming on a computer, robots, kind of that spiraled curriculum where you get to these concepts in as many different ways as possible. In second grade, I do a really tight loop where we um, talk about regular polygons, we program squares and triangles and such in hopscotch and then we use tickle to have the spheral robots do those same things on the ground and that's two and a half or three lessons. Um, I also recommend doing dancing. I love dancing in the hour of code on beyond the hour of code dot com there's in, in the podcast there's one of them that's all about dance and offline programming that I think is from chapter three of the book and it is just the funnest thing in the world. Every opportunity I get to go into, you know, a kindergarten, first grade, second grade class and introduce programming through dance, I do it. Because you take something like the Cupid Shuffle. It's an incredibly simple dance. You go to the left, you go to the right, you kick, you know, there, and you can write these things all as loops and you have directional arrows, you have loops, and then you can give the kids a whiteboard and a partner and challenge them to write a better dance. And you can spend the rest of the class time 
doing the kids' dances and having them come up with, um, like, you know, it's real, solving real world problems is hot in education, right? Here's a real world problem. I've shown you how to do forward, back, left, side, but you want to spin. What does a spin look like? How do you show jazz hands? At one point, I was, I was actually using this during a job interview um, as part of my demo lesson. And one of the first graders looks up at me and says, what's the code for a booty shake? And I say, I think you're going to have to come up with that one and show me. It was amazing. Oh, yeah, with high school kids, you could do that. You can program your friend. I've seen offline programming used even in, like, classroom routines, right? How do you sharpen a pencil? Let's code that, right? You're going to get up. You're going to go from your desk, blah, blah, blah. Um, all kinds of stuff with this. There was a, um, at the Scratch conference, someone had done an offline programming thing where they had written different pieces of programming on a paper fortune teller, often also referred to as a cootie catcher. It is a folded square thing that moves back and forth. I don't know. Uh, but they had code written in different parts of those. And the high school kids were playing with them. And as they selected different things, they had to then enact the piece of code at the end, which was like, if you're standing near your friend, give them a hug or something like that. So that was, you know, really fun. <coughs> Okay. And then you asked about increasing levels of challenges. Some. I will switch back and forth. I'll use the leveled apps. If I really want to have them have a leveled, increasing levels of challenges thing, I'll throw them in leveled apps. That takes care of it. With uh, Scratch Junior, what I usually do is I ask them to do one thing and I introduce like one button but I give them the opportunity to find all of the other buttons. And in general, I under-instruct when I code, which means I tell them what I want them to do. I don't tell them how to do it. And I hold them accountable for running through the tutorial. All right, I want to talk a little bit about level editors. These are another thing that you find in Hour of Code and kind of in the world of ways to bring coding into your class. Level editors are things that allow you to build video games. Um, and I already see one that I need to add to this that I don't currently have on there, but I'm, I'm blanking on the name. It was, oh, it's really good. OK, I'll have to remember it. But we'll start with the ones that we have listed here. Uh, GameStar Mechanic is a website that I used five years ago. I think it still exists. It allows you to build a side-scroller style video game. And we had students in seventh grade who were learning the body systems. And they built different video game levels to represent different systems. They weren't perfect. They required explanation. They engaged in what I call analogous thinking, where you set one thing equal to another, and then you explain how it, you know, why it means that. And that was a really great way for the kids to learn. And they had a lot of fun, and they built video games, which was really nice. Yeah, Swift is super awesome. I haven't used Swift a whole lot, so I haven't. I've, it's not in this presentation, but um, yeah, Ben, you're right. They they have elements of game design, and they have tutorials that teach the kids how to build each level. And so you get that. Uh, Mario Maker, if if you have a Wii U. You can now build your own levels of Mario, which is fun and cool. Um, haven't actually used that in class, but it is amusing that it's, um, it exists. If you don't know the Foos, the Foos is amazing, and my kids love it, and they have levels that you can build in there. It blows me away that I can, like last year, I was teaching first grade, and we were using the Foos, and we were playing one of the levels, and one of the girls says, I've, I've never played a video game before. And I said, oh, okay, that's okay. This is how you do it. And she started playing the video game. And then in a little while, she was creating her own video game level. And I thought to myself, so this student lives in a world where every video game she's ever played, she could edit it. That's amazing. That's a game changer, right? That's not the world I live in. Um, <coughs> pardon me. And then CodeMonkey. CodeMonkey, I love CodeMonkey. If you don't know CodeMonkey, check it out. It's got a 
30 some free levels and it is a great introduction to text based coding. My third graders ate up CodeMonkey. They loved it. They need to do some typing, but you can also press buttons to make the stuff come in and it, it's a good introduction to text based syntax. Um, so th those are all exciting things and CodeMonkey also does have a playground in it. Uh, Foo Studio has some degree of a playground in it that were really good. Lightbot's good, Marine. Um, sometimes my kids had a challenge with Lightbot just because it's uh, it's got this weird three quarter view, so sometimes they can't figure out which direction to make it turn. Aim for analogous meaning. That's the whole set something equal to something else, right? It's just like the horrible drawings we all did when we were in preschool of our family. That looked amazingly like the drawing I would do now of my family. I'm going to talk a little bit about robots. I'm not going to focus on it a lot because they require you to actually have the robots. But when you're thinking about like my school, should we get robots? There's a lot of th fun things you can do with it. Um, this is actually a lesson where we were using Sphero and uh, the Draw and Drive app. Here, I'll use a pointer. The draw and drive app, uh, where they actually draw the path they want the robot to take, and then the robot follows that path. So these were kindergartners. They loved it. When you're thinking about working with a robot, there's four different ways I found that I've worked with robots. Uh, robot is pointer, robot is actor, robot is constant, and robot is innovation engine. Um, and those are kind of increasing level of complexity as we go down. The robot as pointer, yeah, having totally. The, the thing about game creation is that's one of the best opportunities you have to do complex applied learning, right? So whether they're designing a gold rush game or a side scroller or whatever, um, it's really powerful. So apparently I don't have detailed slides on these. That's good. I'll just talk about them really quick. Robot as pointer is what you see right here. They were rolling a dice and adding them up. They were rolling, I believe, um, four die and adding them up. And then they would make the robot go to the number that they had added up to. Robot as actor is where we have the students write a um, a skit and then program the robot to act that skit out. Um, it's the same kind of thing. Lori, you were talking about having in high school math students use math to, uh, Scratch to explain math concepts. One of the things I love is when we take Scratch and we have them write uh, computational programs, it forces them to think about the problems they're solving conceptually. So oftentimes in math we strive for conceptual understanding, but we get trapped by giving the kids computation work to do. But when we ask them to do that math work in a programming platform, instead of solving one problem, you're going to write a computer program that could solve all of those types of problems. It really gets them up to that, um, up to that conceptual level. With robot as actor, it's, you know, if you would have them write a skit between two characters, then the robot's just one of those characters. Robot as constant is a fun thing to do in science where you write a program for the robot and then you interfere with the environment and notice how that changes what the robot does. So if you're studying friction, it could be different surfaces. If you're studying, you know, the impact of going up an inclined plane, you could do that. That's what my second graders did. They had a robot that was running one program and they had a bunch of different ramps and they had to figure out what that meant. And they explored and learned and it was amazing. <coughs> the last one with the robot series is Robot as Innovation Engine and that's an opportunity to really move into making and tinkering. There's a lot of robots out there like Thymio, like the hummingbird robots that really allow you to kind of begin to bridge between programming and the physical world. Makey Makey also comes into this. Uh, I want to just circle back as we get near the end here uh, that social skills are really important. It's nice to have 30 some slides, right? I have ambitious slide decks. Um, 
I love programming with pre-readers, and this is uh, one of Jeff's kids, uh, Jeff Bradbury, teacher cast. If you want to know more about these kids, you can follow them at the Edge of Triplets. Um, right? I love that picture, too. This was when I got to meet them, and I put the eyeball stickers on Robert's head. Um, Debots are fun, but as people in the chat have mentioned, there's a purple mouse version on Amazon that's really cheap. And if you uh, want a more affordable version, that's a good way to go. Here's a better shot of the uh, what I call the robot bochi ball, where we put a target in the middle and they have to navigate in and then navigate out. And no one's allowed to be inside of the robot-only zone that keeps them from walking on top of each other's robots. Um, I think. Ah, yes. So some, a couple of important ideas as we close out here. Have something awesome for everyone to do. Sometimes you're like, well, I only have one robot, so we'll just have everyone take turns. And that's, in a lot of ways, a horrible idea because you want something active and valuable for everyone to do. This can be a challenge, especially with group, works and, group work and robots, but it is possible. And it's a challenge worth addressing. Yeah, Ben, I've used little bits. They're super awesome. Uh, they're an important part of the tinkering we're doing at school. And I actually have uh, some on a wall outside for the kids to play with freely. So at this point, I'd like to open it up for questions because while there's a lot of other things I could say, I think that there have been a lot of great questions coming up so far. I, you know, Maureen mentioned Puzzlets. I've used Puzzlets this year uh, with my youngest kids, and I like them, but so far they're, it's a very closed system. There's only one activity, and they do require kind of that station that they sit at with the little different pieces. Um, but it is interesting. Yeah, there, there's a lot in here. This uh, When you think about STEM, here is, again, my first graders learning about uh, the coral reef. We use that. Um, oh, yeah, this is what, what excites me about programming is how much work there is to be done in literacy with it. Um, and I've just had a really great time teaching kids and finding those different opportunities. Oh, here was a super fun thing. So we used the spherals to paint, and we just had them run through paint. Uh, the teachers who have done this who are smarter than me take, like, pool noodles and put them around it so the spheral can't run all over the floor. Uh, this was, they told me on uh, uh, Monday that they were going to put in a new floor in my room at the end of the week, so I had to hurry up and get this done before they, they put in the good floor because they weren't going to let me do this once the good floor was in. <laughs> oh, okay. That's right. The end of the slide deck is just a bunch of stuff that came with the template for the slide. That's why there's so many slides. Yeah, the first grade coral reef project, they had been learning about the coral reef, and typically they would create their own animals, and they would study them, and they would paint them and build them out of paper. And then what I did, it was early in the year, so it was just another getting to know Scratch Junior sequence. And I took the, um, the simple idea of a loop, and I showed them how to make a fish swim back and forth across the underwater background. And both of those were included in Scratch Junior. So that was uh, what we did. And they just played with it and created their own aquarium. But the conversations ended up being all about coral reef things. A uh, really great question from Doug about any particular languages. I don't. I start, when I started working with code in the classroom, I was very concerned about what languages I would use. But I find that my kids can to jump back and forth between what they're doing based on what situation they're working in. Um, the, we use mostly Scratch because I'm a pre-K through sixth grade. Uh, we get into some Python, but it's based on what we want to do. We were working with an Arduino, and there was some Python needed. So I taught them a little bit of Python. 
But before they could get freaked out about using Python, I asked them to turn to their neighbor and ask them, have you ever programmed in Python? And then as their neighbor gave their answer, I interrupted. And I said, you just need the question. How many people can tell me what a past participle is? None of them could. And I said, well, you all just used a past participle effectively. And that's kind of what we're going to do in Python today. And I was able to show them the structure they needed. And it's not about the deep learning of any one language. It's about knowing enough to get through what you're going to do on that day. So I'm looking at the chat to see if there's any questions. Oh, yeah, I Minecraft as much as I can. There's a, a Raspberry Pi Foundation has an amazing thing you can do with Minecraft where you can actually uh, have the kids program Minecraft using uh, Blockly or uh, Python. It's super amazing. Cano also has one of those, and I've done a lot of work with that. Uh, the Cano kits are crazy fun if you're thinking that, wow, what you really should do is build computers with kids. Check out the Cano computing kits because they are awesome. Yeah, Piper is amazing too. Uh, coding versus graphic interface should be, it's all about what you're doing, right? Like I have, I, I think that uh, Gary Steiger and Sylvia Martinez put it best in the Invent to Learn uh, book when they took on this question of what language should you use. And they really advocated for Scratch. And basically what it is, is kids will use Scratch until what they're doing is complex enough that Scratch is a pain in the butt. And then they're going to be able to move pretty easily over to whichever text-based coding is most appropriate for what they're doing because they've reached that level of complexity. <clears throat> Yeah, Paul, I think that's a great idea is to have the kids, um, we do a family coding day at uh, one of the schools I work with, and kids run a lot of those sessions, and that's a really great thing. Um, yeah, you can, you can 3D print Minecraft using a program called Mineways, and with my fourth graders, they actually designed something in Minecraft that we then printed out. Yeah, that piece by uh, Mary Beth is great. We're reaching the top of the hour, and if there's any more questions, I'd love to take them. I believe that programming is something that any teacher can do with any kid. And they can find a way to bring it into their classroom in a way that really increases the learning happening there and ups the cognitive complexity. So I encourage everybody to check out code.org forward slash learn and you know follow the Hour of Code hashtag and see what other teachers are doing. I did capture some questions that you didn't answer, Sam. So let me see if I can find them. Are the the apps that the kids actually do the programming for, are they accessible? Yeah. I guess it depends on what they use to do the programming. Well, all the stuff that um, inside of code.org forward slash learn works on a bunch of different platforms. Mm -hmm. So when we run coding events at my school, we run it on PC laptops, Mac laptops, Chromebooks, iPads, you name it. Have you tried Cody bots? I have seen them. I haven't tried them yet. But there's so many different, um, yeah, it's, it almost seems like every 10 minutes there's another Kickstarter that pops up with mm -hmm. somebody's robot designed to teach students to learn. And there, you know, there's a lot of great opportunities out there. And it's, you know, it can be challenging looking at all of them and say, well, which one should I bring to my kids first? And I'm always looking mm -hmm. for the ones that are either really simple or going to give me the you know, most customizable experience. So things like Sphero I love because they're just stone simple. They turn on, they work, or they need to be sent in for service. Um, <laughs> there's really mm -hmm. no in between. And um, there's a lot of very simple things I can do with them. But other things like the Hummingbird Robots Kit is amazing 
but there's a bit a bit more of a learning curve on it, and you you know have to be able to figure out how to do more things. So it's all about just what opportunity you want to bring to your kids. Mm -hmm. App Inventor was just mentioned by Ben is a really great platform. MIT App Inventor. It's been around for a while. I have coached Technovation teams, which is a really great project for girls. Technovation. Um, that use App Inventor as part of a design thinking challenge process. And there are some really good App Inventor Hour of Code tutorials available also. And when students build something in App Inventor, they can actually see that app working on their device. It is for Android devices. Those were the questions that I found. Excellent. Sam, you did manage to to ask or answer most of them as they came by. Good. I, I was um, trying to keep my eye on the yeah. chat, and that's you did the, very well at that. The easiest um, way to do this because it's much easier as a conversation than me just droning on. Uh, right. But if you like me talking in a way that's completely uninterrupted, <laughs> <laughs> you can check out beyondthehourofcode.com forward slash iTunes where we have all of the podcasts. Mm. And yes, Ben, uh, Scratch does have Hello World. Uh, they have say blocks yep. that let you just type inside that and your character can say it. So right. it's and actually you know, really easy for Scratch to do that. My first activity in Scratch or Scratch Junior is always make the cat dance. When you open up mm -hmm. a new program, there's a cat in the middle of the screen. Yep. And you can make the cat move around, and that's you know usually enough for a good 15, 20 minutes of kids freaking out about how cool it is, and then you mm -hmm. teach them how to delete the cat because they want something else to dance. Right, right. Thanks, Paula. Thanks again so much, Sam, for for presenting to us today. I'm now going to turn the show over to Peggy. Who will tell us what's coming up? Thank you so much, Sam. I think we could have gone on for another hour easily. But well I'll beyond. <laughs> well beyond. I'll put all of your slides in the live binder so people can see what you didn't specifically talk about. And all of your links are there, too. So thanks a lot. Thank and we you. hope all of you will come back. We have lots of great shows coming up. Um, next Saturday, we're going to be talking about Pika Pack, which is a character education program for young students, pre-K through grade three. No show on Thanksgiving weekend in the United States, but then we have a, a couple of great featured teachers coming up. December 3rd is Nikki Randenberg, and December 17th is Valerie Lewis. Both of them are doing amazing things with technology with their students. Then we'll take a winter break for a couple of weeks, and we'll back, be back the beginning of January to celebrate all of the shows and presenters we've had through this past year and just have some fun together. So come and join us whenever you can. I do want to let you know there are some great things coming up. This next week, the Global Education Conference is starting. And it is always amazing. And there are, it goes for like four days, and there are multiple presentations every hour. It's all free. So check it out. Look at the schedule. Find those that you're interested in. Join the live sessions if you can, but they're all recorded. So if you can't make it to the live times, they even have times in the middle of the night for the US so that they're good times for people in other countries around the world. So be sure to check that out. Also, the K-12 online mini conferences are going on. And they started with Julie Lindsay last week. And she did an awesome keynote presentation and then followed it up with a great panel discussion with a number of different people about the presentation. This next week, we have um, David Jakes doing the keynote presentation all about learning spaces. And then that will be followed by a panel presentation on 
follow on the following Thursday. So all those links are in the live binder. So be sure to check those out. And our usual wrap up, since we're a little bit over time, be sure to check out Steve Hargadon's Learning Revolution project. He has lots of the conferences posted and updated on that site. And we hope you'll think about nominating a featured teacher. We really love those sessions. And we're always looking for new teachers. And some of you could be our featured teacher, you know. Lori, go ahead. All right, Peggy. Peggy. Uh, the Classroom 2.0 Live survey should open as you exit the session. It will open in your browser, or you can take the link from the chat, whether it's the live session or the log, or from within the live binder, you can also take the survey link. Once you complete the survey, you can request a professional development certificate. It will now print your name on the certificate. Thanks to Patty Ruffing, she sends these out. And also make sure that goes to a personal email. School emails tend to block them from getting to you. Special thanks to our special guest, Sam Patterson, to Steve Hargadon, founder of Classroom 2.0, Teacher 2.0, Future of Education, and the Learning Revolution, to Blackboard Collaborate for our webinar platform, and to everyone who participated in the show today. Thanks so much for coming.